And welcome to the Big Bold Jewish Climate Fest. I'm Lisa Colton, and I'm so excited that you're here today with us to kick off this five-day festival 
that's making climate change and action a central moral priority of the Jewish community. We have over 165 events, hundreds of presenters, thousands of participants, and together we're creating something really special, even at a very difficult time. Today we have four really distinguished guests who are going to have an amazing conversation, not only about the past of this movement, but also the present and the future, in order to frame our conversation for the next five days of this festival. So to introduce them, to begin, Eric Fingerhut is the president and CEO of the Jewish Federations of North America. And prior to JFNA, he was the president and CEO of Hillel International. He also had a varied and distinguished career in public service and higher education prior to those roles. And I had the pleasure of collaborating with Eric on FedLab last year, which really only was 14 months ago, but feels like forever. Ruth Messenger was the president and CEO of American Jewish World Service from 1998 to 2016 and continues as an ambassador for the organization. Prior to AJWS, she had a 20 year career in public service in New York City as a city council member and Manhattan Borough president. She is a tireless advocate for social change and a visionary. And Ruth mobilizes rabbis and faith-based communities throughout the US to promote human rights. Nigel Savage founded Hazon, the Jewish Lab for Sustainability in 2000, and for more than 20 years has been building and leading a movement that strengthens Jewish life and contributes to a more environmentally sustainable world for everyone. Before founding his own, Nigel was a professional fund manager in London. He was a founder of Limud New York and serves on the board of Romemu. And I first met Nigel in Jerusalem in, I think, 1998, 1999. And it's a delight to still be collaborating with you, Nigel. And finally, Rabbi Jenny Rosen is the founder and CEO of Dayenu, a Jewish call to climate action a new organization mobilizing the American Jewish community to confront the climate crisis with spiritual audacity and bold political action. Rabbi Rosen has spent more than two decades leading Jewish nonprofit organizations as a vice president for community engagement at Hyas and as the director of Jewish life and values program at the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Thank you all for being with us today to engage in this conversation. So I'd like to start just asking each of you to frame this a little bit from your own perspective where you sit in the Jewish community. Jenny, can we start with you? And will you tell us a little bit about the moral imperative from a rabbinic perspective and why we should be approaching this issue as Jews? Thanks, Lisa. It's wonderful to be, to be here um, with this festival. So the climate crisis is the existential crisis of our time. We know that without very significant changes, we're hurtling towards an unlivable and unsustainable future. And many people are already experiencing the painful impacts of the climate crisis. So we're living in a devastating time. Um, as Jews, we have faced existential crises and disruption and destruction many times through history. Um, and every time we've not only survived, but we've envisioned and rebuilt a different future. Um, and right now we are in such a time. And this moment in history demands that we respond at the scale that science and justice require. None of us can sit this out. As the title of this session you know, indicates, the climate crisis must be a central moral issue of the Jewish community. And we need to be building a powerful Jewish climate movement, one that's spiritually rooted, multi-generational, bold, and centers justice. You know, in the registration for this event, several people asked the question, why should we do this as Jews? Um, and I wanna offer a few responses. First, there are numerous Jewish values that call us to rise to this challenge. Um, they're the classic ones that we often think about, you know, Shomrei Adama, protecting the earth, Bal Tashkit, don't destroy. But at its core, I think the climate crisis is also about social, economic, and racial justice. It's about whether we believe that every human being is created with Salam Elohim in the image of God and deserves to have their most basic human needs met, air, water, food, shelter. Will we protect the most vulnerable? Will we choose life? Most fundamentally, what's at stake is whether humanity will continue the door of door, generation to generation. These are just a few of the Jewish values. I'm sure we all could think of many, many more. Um, but there are other reasons for a Jewish communal response. 
there is a diverse movement of people fighting for climate justice, including faith groups and black, brown, indigenous communities, young people. We need every part of our wonderful, diverse American community, including the Jewish community. We're only 2% of the population. But as we know, the Jewish community has an outside voice in American society and politics. And I would say also religious voices in general have an important role to play in shaping our national narratives and solutions in ensuring also that there are certain values that we center like human dignity and social justice and the public good. And there's, there's a power, I think, in spiritually rooted activism. We bring Jewish history and experience and teachings and tradition and faith and song. We bring all of this to the movement. And, and finally, I think Jews are grappling with this existential crisis on a spiritual and religious for some religious level. And we need to be supporting them Jewishly to live with greater integrity and wholeness uh, and attend to the spiritual issues that this crisis raises. So I think if the Jewish community is to be responsible or even frankly relevant, it really is hardly a choice. Uh, we need to be mobilizing Jewish support for climate solutions. We need to build our collective power together with national and global movements and raise up a spiritual, religious, and moral voice. So I'm really looking forward to talking together about what that might look like. Thank you. I, uh, I appreciate what you started by saying. We've done these big thorny problems before, right? We, we left Egypt and we reinvented ourselves when the temple fell and we wrote down the oral Torah when we all had to disperse. So we're good at this adaptive leadership stuff. And I think this is our, our newest, uh, maybe not newest, latest major thorny challenge um, that we need to tackle for, for all the reasons you just said. Nigel, you've been at this for multiple decades, leading a movement to bring Jews into this conversation and to make change. Give us some key lessons from, from what you've learned over the last 20 years. Um, so Lisa, thank you for that. And thank you, everybody who's on this panel and everybody who's watching and involved in the festival. It's, it's really an amazing way to, to bring two wish to life in the 21st century. Um, I think I really wanna say three somewhat different things. The first one is that I'm really struck by the extent to which most people feel some version of guilty, overwhelmed and disempowered. And I think we don't always say that, but almost every person feels literally overwhelmed by the scale of the challenge, disempowered by how small we are in, in the face of it, and guilty, I should be doing X, but I'm not, and I'm not doing such and such, but I should do. Um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I think that we have to acknowledge that to widen the circle. People think and feel those things, but they don't necessarily say them, and I think it's really critical. Secondly, I want to say that underneath the radar, there has been extraordinary growth in the Jewish environmental movement, the Jaffe movement over the last 20 years, Jewish outdoor food farming, environmental education. And it's not just Khazan, but we've seen um, urban Adama, wilderness Torah, Pearl Stone, um, milk and honey farm, Shoresh in Toronto, Sadet in London, um, JCAM, the Jewish Climate Action Network, the Jewish Earth Alliance, Almost everywhere stuff is happening underneath the radar and growing. And it's not because there is any single, as it were, mega funder who's making this happen. Person by person, institution by institution, community by community, people are essentially saying, we're not required to complete this task, but neither can we desist from it. And the, 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 the growth of that and the things that we are learning from that and gaining from that is really significant. And so the third thing is, I think, putting these two pieces together, because I think that we have a really complicated conflation of acute and chronic language. On the one hand, this is acute in the sense that, that the world really needs change right now, like it really, really does. And yet, on the other hand, there are 7 billion people living unsustainably on this planet. And we're going to be dealing with these issues for the remainder of our lives, literally. And so we have to somehow balance a sense of urgency with a, a real medium term commitment. I think the heart of the lesson from the last 20 years is really what we need to do in the next decade, which is to craft a multi-year transformation of Jewish life 
so that if 10 years from now you walk into any Jewish institution, it will be absolutely clear that to be Jewish is to work for a more sustainable world for everybody. I think increasingly we've thought of it as being analogous in a certain way to the Jewish women's movement. People said, why can't a girl have a bat mitzvah? Why shouldn't a woman be a rabbi? Why should women be paid less than men? And it literally took 70 years and a huge raft of organizations, programs, books and stuff. But if you walk into any Jewish institution today as a girl or a boy or anybody else, it's different. And that's what I think we have to systematically accomplish in the next 10 years. And I think it needs all of our ideas, all of our tradition, all of our people and all of our organizations. Thank you. That makes me excited for the coming years. And, and I hope that we can start to see that start manifest um, in so many ways that go beyond the recycling bin and the social health, because it is a bigger issue. Um, Ruth, in the context of being a bigger issue, what's so interesting about this is that we're all in it together. And I think the pandemic maybe shed some light on that in a way that a lot of people haven't really grappled with before, that this is a global issue and will be all of our responsibilities, even if it doesn't impact all of us equally. Can you shed some light for us on our responsibility as a global community to be solving a global problem? Um, yes, I will, Lisa. I'm delighted to be here. I'm really um, moved by what um, Jenny and Nigel had to say. I think this is an important way to open a, a grand festival with all kinds of people participating. I want to note that Nigel said, which of course is of course true, that it's easy on the environment and on several other issues for people to feel overwhelmed. And so the, the fundamental message there is that we don't have the luxury of retreating to being overwhelmed. We have a, we have a tradition that says that every single person has to contribute no matter whether or not the task is complete. And if we honor that, then we will all feel more engaged, more empowered, and we'll all be doing things that make a difference. But you asked me to talk about the global issues. And I, I wanna say that it's first of all, moral and theological, which I, which I think that Jenny spoke to, but she, she gave a variety of um, teachings from our text. Um, for me, just the most fundamental one is we are all equally made in the image of God. Um, and we have an obligation to the other and the stranger and to pursue justice wherever injustice exists. But for me, there is obviously from my two decades of work with American Jewish World Service, um, a broader notion and that is, what does global actually mean? And it's so easy, our, our American lives, most of us are American, enforce this, our national lives, wherever we live, our personal lives, particularly when there's a crisis, we tend to be thinking smaller and smaller. Like, what do I need to do to deal with this? What should I be doing if I want to be environmentally more correct? And not to think about that big picture. But as I said, there's a moral and a theological ob obligation to think large. There's also a very practical one. We are in fact a very small planet in the shape of things. And when it comes to some of the world's biggest disasters and worst problems, what happens in one place affects people every place. So that makes it hard for people to think that way. But in the case of the environment, it's dramatic. Before I give you those examples, I wanna note, we are all dealing at some level right now endlessly with this pandemic. And I quote from this morning's New York Times, a failure to distribute the vaccine in poor nations will worsen economic damage with half the costs borne by wealthy countries. Now that's very pragmatic and very economic, but it's making the point that if we solved the rollout of the vaccine, God willing, in our various states, if the rest of us were as quick as West Virginia to solve the problem, we'd be doing well. Um, but if we did that and paid no attention to the huge problems with this pandemic that already exist all over the world, to be honest with you, the best expression is it will come back to bite us in the tuchus. So that's, that's for real. The same thing is true on the environment. So here's a number. There are today 25 million so-called climate refugees. It's not a word that quite exists, 
because many climate refugees are actually refugees still in their own country. And we're used to the notion of refugee as meaning people who are for oppression or war have to our ethnic cleansing end up being pushed out of their own country. Some large percentage of climate refugees actually never leave their country. But the lack of attention to the climate, the lack of attention to global warming is forcing people off of their land. By the way, while much of this is a natural phenomenon, not all of it is because interest in the land pursued by people with lots of wealth and power, so multinational corporations, is also creating climate havoc all over the world. But the UN says that 25 million refugees, including climate refugees, including those in their own country, is a drop in the bucket. And then in the next 10 to 20 years, that number will escalate and escalate and escalate as parts of the world, if we neglect climate issues, become uninhabitable or remain inhabitable, become no longer a place where people can farm and therefore people have no resources. So not to take away from the powerful moral and theological arguments, this is for me also a pragmatic issue. So we have a huge problem which exists all over the world and which those of us who are beginning to address it and thank God for all the people at this festival, beginning to address it in our own homes and communities, thinking about it as a Jewish issue, have to pay attention as American Jewish World Service has now for over 35 years to the people elsewhere in the world who are also our sisters and brothers. And I would close with a quote that's not often shared, but is powerful. It's actually, I describe it the least ever heard what piece of wisdom in the world. It was from Rabbi Joachim Prinz, who had the honor of speaking at the March on Washington a minute and a half before Dr. King. And so it's not easy for people to remember what he said, but he said, neighbor is not a geographic concept, it's a moral concept. These are all our neighbors and we all have to make environmental improvements together. Thank you, powerful. So moving from a global scale to our own community, Eric, will you talk to us a little bit about your perspective on Jewish communal responsibility, not, not acting only as individuals, but, but as a community? Sure, Lisa, thank you for uh, including me in this. It's wonderful to be with this distinguished group. Uh, we haven't seen each other in person for a while. Nigel and I actually even office in the same office that we haven't seen each other in almost a year. So it's great, great to see you all. Um, and to be part of this festival, thousands of people participating. I'm excited that they're here. I also hope that everybody is healthy and safe. And to all those who've been suffering these last few several months, uh, we send our love uh, and care and glad that you're part of this community. Um, but I, I will approach it from a little different angle than, than, the, other, uh, than the other speakers. Uh, you know, you referenced Lisa earlier, the, you know, the, the exodus and the, the different times that we've rebuilt our uh, the Jewish people. Of course, we're in the middle of reading the story of the Exodus now. We're almost at the, the climactic uh, moments. Uh, and, uh, and what I observe about it as the leader uh, of the Jewish Federations of North America, which is, of course, the largest, most comprehensive set of Jewish establishment institutions, 146 federations, so over 200 independent network communities with which we work. And previous to that, I led another large institution, Hillel, you know, 600 Hillels. We're, we're the establishment, right? And so what, 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 I, uh, uh, what I observe is that uh, Jews are the most organized people in the world. Um, you know, from, from the minute that we got the Torah at Mount Sinai, what's the first thing that happens? Uh, Moses's father, father-in-law Yitro, uh, talks to Moses about organizing the the uh, the community into different subcourts so that it could take some of the burden off of him. And then the tribes organize, and then to build the Mishkan, we separate the artisans from the priests from the. I mean, we are an organized people. That's what we do. Even my panelists, my fellow panelists, every one of them either started or leads, uh, or you know, a single organization or participated in multiple organizations. So I think we need to see Jewish organizational life uh, as not the not the opponent of uh, of change, but as the opportunity uh, to bring change. Um, and so I want to uh, speak, you know, on behalf of the Jewish Federation system to say that you know, view us as an opportunity uh, to all those who are listening uh, to, to 
to bring this agenda uh, to uh, to the uh, the Jewish world. Uh, and uh, I'll just suggest three three things you can do. Uh, one is encourage us to literally put it on the agenda, right? I mean, the agendas of our meetings are set by those who participate. The agendas of our conferences are set by those uh, by those who participate. Uh, and uh, you know, as Nigel knows, we, we just had, I think the first ever environmental um, uh, section uh, at our virtual GA, the General Assembly, as you know, is sort of the premier gathering of the Federation system, really the communal system uh, every year. And uh, I don't know, Nigel, maybe you know when before we've had an environmental uh, session. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't in person, but, but in, as a result, it drew, as everybody's been experiencing, many, many more people than we would have otherwise had. So you know, put it on our agenda. Make sure that it's part of what uh, our meetings are about, our committees are about, our uh, our, our leadership is talking about. Secondly, you know, encourage us to play leadership roles. Obviously, the fact that I'm here, the fact that we're a sponsor of this uh, of this uh, uh, festival uh, is, uh, you know, is is a statement in itself, um, and uh, and and something that we want to do more. But I was happy to participate with uh, with uh, Nigel in uh, in Hazon's uh, Sound the Call. Event recently, as I mentioned, we're, we're thrilled that Nigel and has own office with us, and um, you know, and and these are the types of things you can do uh, as uh, as a communal organization to to show that the environmental cause is is a part of uh, uh, of who we are. Uh, and then, thirdly, obviously, encourage us to take specific actions. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm I'm a huge believer about when you lead organizations uh, the size of um, uh, the size of uh, of the federation system and and these other large uh, institutions is we we really have a responsibility to start with our own house if you will right um, you know when we were uh, all responding uh, urgently to the call for racial justice after the killing of George Floyd and the uh, and the issues and the and the uh, appropriate uh, 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 you know raising of voices across the country our first question was are we doing enough to be inclusive, right? Are we, um, you know, uh, are we inclusive of Jews of color? Is our leadership diverse? Is our professional, um, you know, uh, uh, team diverse? And so I encourage us to start there as well on these environmental issues, right? Our, through our grant making, through our allocations, through our, um, you know, through our conference, through our, through our own travel, through our own conferences, through our own, uh, you know, uh, offices, through our own partnerships. Uh, you know, I know, you know, you talked about the going beyond the recycling bin at, at the Kiddush, you know, in the in the shul and 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 to be sure that's true. But but let's be let's be uh, real that we support powerful and large organizations, agencies that serve human services needs and health needs and safety. And I mean, the, the corners that at schools and education, I mean, the, virtually every aspect of Jewish life is being supported through the uh, organized orga organizational community. Um, and can and it and we can have a powerful reach. So help us make sure that that we're having that reach. And since since Ruth ended with her one of her favorite uh, rabbinic quotes, uh, I'll do the same for mine. It's a, a one of the it's from Rabbi Heschel, but lesser known, who says that uh, that that um, uh, gratitude uh, is what makes the soul great. So I want to say that I have gratitude today for the work of this festival for all the people who have come together, the impact that you're making. And I urge you to help us make a greater impact as well. Thank you. So I'm curious from that to explore a little bit why this hasn't become a stronger, more primary moral issue for the Jewish community as a whole. We're clearly seeing through this festival that it exists in a thousand places within the community. And there's been amazing work already happening as evidenced by Hazon over 20 years and, and Dainu uh, and hundreds of other organizations and leaders. And yet it hasn't kind of become this, this central gravitational force. And I'm curious if very briefly uh, you might offer maybe one reason, it's not the whole reason, um, why this hasn't quite elevated to that level yet. Eric, do you have any thoughts? Well, I'm sure that that uh, it's it's an observation that is uh, not unique to, to my panelists, but you know, obviously the 
the organizational world that I'm part of uh, was created to sustain, to protect, first of all, the health and safety of the, of the Jewish community. Um, and unfortunately, uh, recent years have seen a need to increase the, uh, the commitment to, to security. We've seen some of the most uh, uh, tragic, uh, violent events uh, in, in uh, history of the American Jewish life, unfortunately, in the last few years. Uh, we're now living through a health pandemic. And even before that, we had a crisis of health care uh, that was reaching uh, large parts of our community. Um, and then uh, we also are uh, committed, as I know others on this, uh, uh, on this Zoom are, to Jewish identity and engagement. And, you know, as we've lived in this uh, increasingly diverse and open society, the need to create, you know, uh, uh, organized Jewish life. Uh, so all of these things have been, you know, have been on, on top of the priority uh, agenda uh, and, and probably have, have made it feel like there's less room at the top of the agenda to those uh, who are activists. And, and, I, and I'll say, and, and uh, we, saw, we see this from Rabbi Rosen's organization, from Nigel's organization, and from all the, Nigel listed a whole armful of, uh, other, uh, of other initiatives, you know, that there is a sense in which a lot of this uh, energy has come in an entrepreneurial way, bottom up, start new organizations, start new coalitions. Uh, and again, that's why I think it's important that, that uh, we be here today to say, you know, let's, let's not, let, let, don't write off the organized uh, establishment Jewish community, rather, uh, you know, view it as an opportunity. It does feel like a turning point um, culturally, nationally, internationally on this issue, not only for our community, but, but with that wind at our backs, so to speak. Um, hopefully we can seize the opportunity uh, in the Jewish community too. Um, Nigel, brief comments on, on why maybe this hasn't become a bigger issue until now? So first of all, Lisa, I just love that you've asked this question. I think it's a real question. It's a genuine question. I don't think it's a rhetorical question. I think we actually really have to think about it in order to move beyond it. I think there are two things that are particularly problematical because they're things that we want in our moral crises. One is we want there to be bad guys and we want to be good guys. And secondly, we want to be able to define success. So in relationship to the fight against apartheid, for example, in South Africa, you could say they're racist and I'm not racist. And shouldn't there be a free democratic South of South Africa? Wouldn't it be amazing if Nelson Mandela were president? And on this thing, A, there are no obvious bad guys. I mean, we can talk about the oil companies and various people who actually really have behaved badly. But at the end of the day, we're all, we're all customers of the oil companies and we all use cars and so on and so on and so forth. And so we don't have that moral clarity. And then the second thing is, it's not like at any point in our life, we're gonna see the headline in the New York Times, great news, climate change fixed, go back to how you were. So in acknowledging those things, I actually think that we have to go beyond them. And in relationship to the first thing, that's why I think that we have to craft a positive vision. And in relationship to the second one, it's why Eric, what you said just now is so exactly right. Somehow or other, we have to craft a vision of actual effective change that is at a level that's smaller than the whole planet in the next 70 years, but is bigger than just me or even just my institution. And I think that if we're able to do that, we will actually really have learned from some of the challenges and help go beyond them. Excellent. Jenny, would you like to add to that about why this issue in general is so challenging? Sure. Um, so I want to first just echo and say amen to both to both Eric and Nigel. I feel like we're telling a story in, you know, in layers. I think another reason is that for a long time, people have thought of the climate crisis as being about the environment or nature out there. Um, and certainly there are powerful and beautiful parts of the Jewish community that have long been engaged with nature and more recently a whole uh, resurgence of farming. But most Jews at this point in history are urban. Um, and I think it's taken a while for folks to realize that yes, this is about trees and plants and animals and ecosystems, and it's also about people. And it's also a social justice issue of who will bear the brunt of economic collapse and whether we address this with equity and justice at the center. This is actually about the future of humanity. 
Um, so I think that sh that is sort of another another layer to this. And you know, studies indicate that 80% of American Jews are concerned about the climate crisis. 80%. Uh, but most are not taking meaningful action outside their personal consumer choices. And I think there are two reasons for this. And this, this goes back to something that Nigel said earlier um, about sort of guilt and overwhelm. I think that people are not sure what they can do to make a difference in the face of such an overwhelming crisis. It feels really technical, science, policy. It feels somehow too complicated and too big. Um, and the second is that I think it's difficult to face the truth of what's at stake on an emotional level, on a psychological level. The fact that without massive change, we're hurtling towards a world in which much of the earth will be uninhabitable, that our children and grandchildren might not have enough food to eat or clean air to breathe or water to drink, that many of the cities we live in may be underwater. It's understandable, but it's like too much to take in. So we, we go through our lives, we take care of our families and our work and we watch Netflix and we make, you know, we all, we all do the things that we do um, to distract ourselves, to engage. It's like, how, how can our souls let that possibility in? So I think in order to make this a central moral issue of the Jewish community, we need to address both of those reasons for an action. We need to give Jews meaningful ways to take the kind of actions that are commensurate with the scale of the crisis. And we need to support Jews and Jewish communities to face and move through this anxiety and angst that the climate crisis provokes, uh, both because it's a, a profound pastoral need and at the same time, part of how we live in the face of this is by taking meaningful action. Right. Ruth, you've had a lot of experience in these big issues and, and not only how we can approach big issues and solve them without being terribly overwhelmed, but also the differences between many of our central rallying cries in the Jewish community that have been really good for the Jews or very focused on our community, the Holocaust, the founding of the state of Israel, freeing Soviet Jews um, versus other more global issues like the crisis in Darfur. Um, can you shed some light on what are the lessons that we can be learning from these other bigger global issues that are seemingly overwhelming? How, how can we find our entry point and, and the place to, to really take action as a global community? Okay, I will, I will try to do that in a minute, um, Lisa. I wanna say, just because Nigel used the, I thought appropriately, but the, the difference between apartheid and uh, ending apartheid between and f I just want to say that you know there's a another another famous unknown person I specialize in those, but they were the chief rabbi of South Africa during uh, Mandela's tenure um, testified at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission at the request of Mandela Mandela and said um, some of us supported the efforts to fight apartheid some in the Jewish community some did not but the fact is everyone in the Jewish community profited from apartheid. It made him hugely unpopular with his bosses, the South African Jewish Board of Deputies. It's a fantastic story. His name, for those of you who'd like to Google him, I'm very, very attached to his story, is Cyril Harris. Um, but I, I, I wanna make that point. It's like, we are allowing ourselves to not think about this bigger picture, as everyone said, because it's very big. But, but it's very easy to just say like, I think I'm doing my part. You know, my husband follows me around the kitchen saying, could you read the sign on the refrigerator? This is a recyclable container. Um, you know, so he's doing his part. He's goading me to do my part. But it's much bigger than that. And, and lots of the problems and challenges of the world are much bigger than that. And they are outside the Jewish community. But then I re refer back to what I said earlier, which is we were not told just to be responsible for the Jewish community. We were told to be responsible for everybody. And that's a tough concept, but boy, have this the last year brought this home with a clear exposure, ex explosion of racial division on the pandemic, racial division on the vaccine. So again, we're, we're sharing this one planet. It's very fragile. And if we don't find more ways to extend that understanding. so. I want to say, of course, this is individual. Of course, this is a piece of what the festival is about. But, but I want to go back to, to what Eric said. He put himself on the spot. So I'm going, to, I'm going to share with that with him. A lot of this is about leadership. You know, we talk all the time about independent decision making, but we also all pay attention to leaders. 
Um, you know, we just had a change of leadership in this country. I think it's going to mean a lot, but it's going to mean a lot because people do listen to their leaders. And as Eric said, when the leadership of the Jewish community correctly is focused on fill in the blank, Jewish continuity, better rituals in your synagogue, even even um, healthier Kiddush is going to take another step up for our leadership, lay leadership, rabbinic leadership, clergy to say, we have to pay attention to the environment. And I, it was interesting that you used the example you did because we had an extraordinary response from the Jewish community, including everyone on this call and half the people at this festival who were alive and thinking then to the genocide in Darfur. For a wonderful bunch of reasons, but one niggling reason was it was a genocide. And we were like, Jews, oh, we know about genocide. But then, by the way, Jews got bored. And so there's a genocide of the of the Uyghur in China, and there's a genocide of the Rohingya in Burma. And it's not quite as easy to focus Jewish attention and to say, genocide is an evil. We know about it. We have to fight it wherever it occurs, wherever it rises up. So I want to say on the environmental issue, some of it is leadership. Um, Eric had a predecessor in um, his position at Hillel. Jenny might remember this. Um, and there was a Hillel conference and there were some, I don't know, Hazonniks, Adamonics, whatever. And they came up to me. I don't know why I end up in this role, but they came up to me and said, like, there are four million young people here and all of the food service is on styrofoam. So I went up to the then president of Hillel and said, "There, you have a rising concern in the room. And you don't see responses like this from leaders all at most very often, but he stood up at the podium and said, this has just been brought to my attention. I have called the hotel management. We are getting rid of all the styrofoam and we will never use styrofoam again at a conference. So it wasn't just what that did to that Hillel conference. It was like a message to literally a couple of thousand young people of like this leader who's here to get our Hillels engaged, X, Y, Z, get us better be better Jews, took, took a few minutes to say, here's a new rule for Hillel, no styrofoam. And it's that kind of constant effort that we need from, from the Hillel leadership, from Eric, whatever, to say, sorry to add to your plate, but it is Jewish to think about the environment. And at least that's the last point I want to make, and not taking away from any of Hazon's efforts or Dayenu's new efforts. There are lots of young Jews who are environmentally concerned, who haven't found um, Adama or Teva or Wilderness Torah or Hazon or Dayenu. And they are working with 350.org and um, the Sierra Club and whatever. And we have a decision to make as a Jewish community. And I'm going to say it this way because there are people on the other side from me. <laughs> it's like, OK, people are doing their environmental thing and we're doing our Jewish thing. There's lots of environmental organizations. There's lots of international relief organizations. Fine. I think that's totally wrong because I think it doesn't speak to who Jews are and are supposed to be in the 21st century. And speaking to all the fantastic people at this festival, if we don't do these things Jewishly, then we lose some of the energy that we could and should be building in the Jewish community. And I've, I've encountered this international relief efforts. You know, I had federations who said to me, we don't have to help American Jewish World Service deal with this typhoon because we're helping X organization. X organization is a great organization, but I want the, the homepage of those federations to say, we are concerned about this genocide. We are concerned about this typhoon. We are concerned about environmental sanity because it's a Jewish thing to do and subtext, if you can come to do it Jewishly, it will strengthen the Jewish community. We could just end right there. <laughs> like, it, that's so beautiful, Ruth. Thank you. Um, I'd like to focus on this sense of leading a little bit more. And, and, and I've been really interested to learn and read a little bit more about the Pope's encyclical, which he published five, um, six years ago now, um, which was really about um, the moral and spiritual underpinnings of, of why we have to care for our common home. Um, and he calls on, on the world to take swift and unified global action on climate change and environmental degradation. We don't have a central figure like the Pope to put this at the top of our agenda. In some ways, I hope that this festival by creating this like gravitational center and momentum is having some of that effect, but, but talking about it alone doesn't actually make change. So um, 
I do think we're hearing a very clear demand from younger generations. I hear it from my, my own children um, and the hundreds and hundreds of young people who are participating in this festival and leading many sessions and took the initiative to propose sessions, teenagers that are running them on their own at a national festival, um, because this is their number one issue and this is their future. So I'm curious, when we have this momentum, when we have a new administration, what does it look like for us to be leading, not just reacting on this issue? Um, we're gonna dive into this for the next several minutes, but Jenny and Nigel, I'm wondering just from your vantage points, if you could start Jenny, talk to us about like kind of the systemic political level. What does it look like to lead at that level? Thanks, Lisa. Um, so I think that if we're going to mitigate the most devastating impacts, right, if we're going to avert total climate collapse, then we need to be taking action, as you said, on a systemic level. Because while personal practices like reducing meat consumption or even communal practices, greening our institutions, these are all very important. And if every single person and institution lowered their carbon footprint, it would not be enough. We would not avoid the most catastrophic impacts of the climate change. It's like, it's too late for that. We're too late for incremental change. We need to be making change as a community, joining together with other communities on a systemic level. So what does that mean? It sounds like a big, it's like a, it sounds like a big overwhelming concept. It actually boils down to a few very specific things. It means cutting the demand for and supply of fossil fuel energy. It means advocating for comprehensive climate policy and changing our political landscape. Uh, president Biden has the most ambitious climate platform of any president, but the scale and speed that he is able to enact that really depends on how much political capital the administration and Congress are gonna spend on climate action when they're competing priorities and interests. Um, and I would say some bad guys. Um, and, and this is where we all come in, showing that the Jewish community is with them advocating to put people back to work, building 100% clean energy economy. The pandemic has given us sort of this unexpected opportunity. We have to rebuild. Are we gonna rebuild in a way that uh, creates new jobs, invests in renewable energy, um, as opposed to supporting polluters or the fossil fuel industry, um, that we're gonna prioritize environmental justice, that we're gonna hold polluters accountable. So those are some of the policy pieces. I think beyond policy, the Jewish community needs to be showing up in key mobilization moments, like climate strikes. We should be out in force. Um, we need to pressure banks and financial institutions that are actually funding the fossil fuel industry. Excuse me. And finally, we need to be fierce allies with frontline communities that are confronting climate injustice and devastation. So the next 10 years are really critical if we're going to make a meaningful enough change. And we need to ensure that we're bringing the full, you know, people and power of the American Jewish community to that. So that I think boils down to three things, amplifying religious and moral voices, organizing the grassroots in all our communities, and to Eric's point, leveraging Jewish institutional power. Excellent. I am, um, I'm thinking about what Ruth said a few minutes ago and, and building on yours, Jenny, that um, another one of our speakers in this festival I was, I was chatting with the other day, and he said, it should be traif, which I thought was a great use of a word, to have a rabbi's pension fund invested in fossil fuels. And yes. this sense of like how we connect our moral and organizational or institutional architecture to this issue um, and really create that culture change where it's like styrofoam, right? You look at it now and you're like, that's not okay. But it wasn't so long ago that many of us, you know, it didn't even occur to us that it wasn't okay. So there's a, a certain amount of education, connecting the dots and then acting on those connections that needs to permeate throughout our, our organizational world. Nigel, I'm wondering if you have just some brief thoughts on what does that look like to lead that culture change in our community? Yeah, so um, 
first of all, I, I really agree with what Jenny said. Well, I agree with what Jenny said and Ruth and Eric. I think that I think it's terribly important that we not just externalize this. So I think at the level of the individual, one needs to do three things. Number one, make some further change in one's own behavior, not because by itself it will change the world, it won't, but because it's the absolute minimum that we need, not merely to look ourselves in the mirror, but to have any standing to speak to anybody else. Number two, we need to give time and money to the organizations that are trying to do this work, because as much as this field has grown in the last 20 years, it needs to grow a lot more in the next 10 years. And number three, we need to raise our voices. And I think that, that raising our voices is in multiple directions. It's not just in, in public space, in terms of both city and state and national government. It's also raising one's voices in the Jewish community. And it's where, Eric, the way that you put it at the start is in fact so profound. The healthy ecosystem that we will create is when there are young Jews, not, not just young Jews, all over the country raising their voices and saying to their leaders, why aren't we doing more? And leaders who are saying, I welcome you, let's do that uh, together. I think that the, um, the places to look are, are places like Detroit and to some extent Boulder and, and different parts. I mean, Detroit and Boulder alone are two very different places, but places where we've started to see systemic change start to happen, right? In Detroit, we've now got more than 25 institutions that are in the Chazon Seal of Sustainability. There is systemic work happening around food. There is stuff happening with the Michigan Food Council. There is stuff that's strengthened between the Jewish community and the African-American community. And at its heart, the nature of what it means to be Jewish in Detroit has started to change around these issues in the last three, four, five years. And ultimately, we need to see some of those changes happening all over the country. Great, thank you. Um, I do wanna just take the opportunity to say two things. One, there's a lot of people who are ahead of us on this issue to learn from, connect with, collaborate with, et cetera. Lots of those organizations and people and leaders are represented in this festival and lots of the leaders of the non-Jewish organizations doing this work are Jewish, which is fascinating and important and a huge opportunity for us because the relationships and the identity and the moral underpinnings are there. Second, we have a few sessions in this festival that focus on the power of cities and states to be really leading change that are often much more nimble than the federal government on a policy level. And I encourage folks to take advantage of those um, because the organizing locally and the Jewish communal voice locally when you're talking to your city council person or your governor um, can be um, all that much more powerful um, as well. Um, fantastic. Okay. Given that we only have a handful of minutes left, I want to invite us to do a quick go around. We are not gonna cover every possible statement we wanna make in this next question, but I'd like to get each of your input on what it means to be walking the walk, not just talking the talk. We had a lot of questions come up in the registration for this session about how to move from good intentions to real change in our local communities. Folks who are on the board of their synagogue, but nothing's been happening and nobody's taking it seriously. And what do we do next to kind of activate and start to really demonstrate these things? I think we've, we've, we've mentioned a few different ideas. The festival will have many more, but I'm curious if we could paint just kind of a collective picture of what it will look like in the future, one, three, five, 10 years, when we have claimed this as a moral imperative in the Jewish community, what will look different? So in a sentence or two, what will it look like when we're doing this well? Nigel. So um, I, I, I spoke last week at two different shuls, Becky in New Haven, Connecticut, and the kitchen in San Francisco, two very, very different shuls but all sorts of stuff is happening there and it's actually different stuff. And it's partly because the rabbis are committed to it and partly because a growing number of people have gotten involved. I think the single key thing, and it goes back to what Eric said earlier on, we've got the Shemitah year coming up, the sabbatical year starting uh, this September. And September of 2022 starts a new seven year cycle in Jewish life. And to anybody who is watching this, if you're involved in any Jewish institution, you should be saying, to the senior rabbi, the CEO, the chair of the board, we need to use this time over the next 12 or 18 months so that by September of 22, 
we have actually framed together as a community a seven-year vision for our institution so that by September of 2029, it will be absolutely clear that we're serious about this stuff. That has to include education and action and advocacy. It has to include the individual, the institution and the wider community. It includes the education that you deliver, the food that you serve, the power that you use, the money that you invest, the interfaith relations that you have, the public statements that you're making. And I absolutely believe, I absolutely believe that we can do that. And I absolutely believe that the heart of this is simultaneously to have a big vision and practical next steps. If it's just a big vision, then it's sort of pie in the sky. If it's just practical next steps, then it's things on a to-do list. And we have to weave these pieces together. And I, I think it's particularly critical, if I may say so, that JFNA, which I think has signaled, like a strong willingness, like Eric, you've been on, amazing on this, but to put JFNA behind it and to have a growing number of federations locally and regionally convening their communities to help make this happen. And then I think it's doable. Awesome. It's like a, a climate strategic planning process. And it, it gives us the framework and the commitment to see it through in the coming years. Eric, would you like to build on that? Yeah, Lisa, I, I would. Uh, and uh, in addition to, to Nigel's comment, I wanna, I wanna go back to something Ruth said uh, a few minutes ago, uh, also talking about uh, about federations and and she said you know no matter how busy our agenda is I think she was referring to my previous comments about about why uh, it answered your question about why maybe it hasn't risen to the to the level she said you know I'm sorry to tell you but we have to add this to our communal agenda uh, and uh, and so I, I want to reflect on two things because because Nigel also uh, raised this point two two points to that comment one is since I'm the representative, I guess, of the organizational world on this on this panel, agendas sound really boring, don't they? Like, oh, you, somebody has to prepare the agenda for the meeting. Agendas are really important, um, and it's a it's a big word and an important word, and it was used by Ruth and by Nigel in its bigger sense, right? Not in its little sense of what point do we take up next in today's meeting, but in its biggest sense of what is our communal. Uh, agenda. So I, I do want to celebrate getting something on the agenda and uh, and keeping it on the agenda and asking, is it on the agenda of today's uh, session or today's meeting or today's conference or, uh, you know, or work and uh, and not in any way, uh, you know, uh, write that off because of its more narrow uh, sensibility. Uh, but I also want to reflect that um, that uh, again, what Ruth said, which I agree with, was we have to add this no matter how busy our communal agenda is, which implies that we need to remember that there are other items on the communal agenda. And there are things of deep importance and urgency at this moment, right? We have people, you, Lisa, you talked about, you know, for, for people who this is their number one issue, the, the sense of sometimes frustration or eagerness to move it forward. And, and you know, I, I, I deal with people every day for whom disability inclusion is, is the number one issue and priority. And they experience the same sense of urgency. We're about to have Jewish Disability Advocacy Month beginning in February to lobby Congress on an inclusion. And I doubt there's anybody participating in this festival that doesn't share in that goal. Uh, we have the issues of, of racial inclusion and equity that we are all uh, that we're all struggling with healthcare uh, issues, uh, you know, as I raised, and we talked about safety and Jewish education engagement, other issues. The, the thing about being uh, on the communal agenda is that there is a communal agenda. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and I just want to urge those who are listening and participating in this festival to get involved um, and, and get involved in the entire communal uh, agenda, because it's you know, the same way community relations works, we care about issues of other communities and because we want them to also listen to the issues of concern to our communities. It's the same way the communal agenda works, right? We listen to others. And you know, when I, I, Ruth and I now, we've chatted about my time in Hillel a couple of times in this meeting. I, mean, I used to, I used to love that, you know, we would, you'd, you'd, you'd go have coffee with a student uh, uh, who was just getting involved in the community on campus. And the student would say, well, why is an environment bigger priority? And, and we'd say, well, it should be, you lead us, right? And so that student would, would form some uh, committee or project, um, which we would support. 
And then we'd say, would you come to the board meeting? Would you tell everybody else about it, right? And when they're there, they also heard about the student who led an inclusion project, the student who led uh, 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 you know, an outreach to the poor, a student who welcomed immigrants to the campus, a student who did, and that's how you begin to understand what the communal collective is about. The federation system ultimately is the communal collective. It's how we collectively address the range of issues that are of concern to our communities. And so I, I wanna close by, my final word is to say to the, the participants in this great festival, join us, get involved. Um, uh, it's how you will be able to put this issue on, on the communal agenda as Ruth uh, challenged us to do, uh, but also, uh, and also lend your energy and caring to the entire communal agenda. That's great. And I, I wanna add to that, Eric, it goes in both directions, right? In this issue, which is to somewhat different than other issues, we see this massive surge of young people taking real, functional, commit, committed uh, leadership roles in this issue. And in some ways, it's us, the established leaders, who have so much to learn from them and how we listen to what is urgent and and powerful to them and to not only invite them to, to come to our meetings, but also to sit on our boards and educate us. And that requires us to also listen to them. Uh, I just want to plug that there's a, a two part session happening in this festival that um, an Avoda fellow in DC has organized, which is a conversation amongst young people about how they can work with more experienced established leaders. And then the second part is an intergenerational dialogue to be able to understand each other better and to use each other's strengths to help move on this issue, which I think is such a, a wonderful and constructive framing and, and speaks a lot to, to what you just said. Uh, we're running short on time, so I'm gonna invite Jenny and then Ruth to add one sentence to this question of what does it look like to walk the walk? Five, 10 years from now, what will be different? One sentence is very, is very hard. I want to say that um, two, two things quickly. One is that I think the mainstream Jewish community understanding that this is the ultimate Jewish continuity issue um, because it is the ultimate continuity issue and putting resources and communal power behind climate policies that science and justice demand. Um, and the second thing I'll say is that we don't have time to spend 10, 20 years kind of talking about this. Um, we need to be taking action and there are lots and lots of Jews ready to do that now. So what could that look like? It could look like hundreds of Dayenu circles and other groups across the country um, that are fully reflective of the diversity of the American Jewish community, all generations, all races, all levels of observance and affiliation um, and these circles and groups will be in synagogues and Hillel's and youth groups and neighborhoods and parent groups and working together with other communities and other faith groups, with black, brown and indigenous communities, taking very clear action, stopping the drilling and burning of fossil fuel, fighting for policies that drastically reduce emissions, electing leaders who have the chutzpah to, to transform society and doing all this with a sense of spirit and a sense of community and a sense of song supported in the work ahead. And I think this is how we can together join and bring our full people in power to creating a world that is just and livable and sustainable for all people for generations to come. Awesome. Ruth, anything you'd like to add? Um, lots, but there isn't much time. So we talked before about people doing things in different places. And so I want to remind people again that my perspective is global, that on the American Jewish World Service website, there is a whole one third of our funding is to groups fighting for land, water and climate justice. And just going to see one or two pictures of communities that are literally underwater and then trying to understand that's going to happen here. I would challenge Eric, whether it's a US city or a global story, those are the kinds of images and ideas that should be shared out to the federations. They're not all going to pick up on them, but I want to say one word about the communal agenda. Thank you, Eric, for what you said, but I think it's incumbent on leaders to understand precisely that it's not the agenda for the meeting. The agenda for the meeting is everyone around this table is going to discuss these six issues. The communal agenda has to be big, big in terms of numbers of issues, bigs in terms of local and global. And the message from leaders has to be, 
I can hold all of this in my hands so that you, you the individual, you the subcommittee, you the, the, the lay board can pick up on issues as they make sense to you. We're not all going to do whatever, ending racism in healthcare in America. We're not all going to do environmental action, much that everyone at the festival is, but go into your universe and just be sure it's on the agenda so all those people who can be educated about it have a place to go, have a place to come, understand that it is a Jewish as well as a world issue. Um, and it's the challenge of leaders to keep all of those balls in the air and not say we're gonna drop three of them because this is important. And the, the last thing I wanna say is the leaders that we're talking about, constant education. You only run into people, you can't list 12 agenda issues in every sermon, but you can do a thousand other things. What do the websites look like? What is there a place to say? Do you want your community to be more um, uh, environmentally conscious and environmentally friendly? Um, it's a silly thing, but but it's not a silly thing. Constant reminders, the kiddish table, this is the food we are serving and we are not serving the following food because it's not local. Um, this, is a, this is an extension, but um, those people who've heard me speak, um, I begin most of my speeches with a land acknowledgement, talking about who originally occupied the land. Because the question of who occupies land and who controls water is central to every single thing about our lives from the beginning of the Torah right up to today. And I learned in two months, 10 years ago now, in Australia and New Zealand, that when you hear that message every morning, at every school you go to, at every public event you go to, in every museum, it gradually becomes a part of your consciousness. And there are a thousand ways on the environment in which in our buildings, in our Federation buildings, we could be giving that message. We could be saying, um, this, th these are new issues. It could say it over the fountains in the, in the men's and ladies rooms. It could say it over the kiddish food. It could say it because there's a place to just start it off. It's a, it's a set of messaging about the critical importance of the environment to our future that I think fits with everything that my co-panelists have said, but it's just what's the constant way to remind people and putting it in a bulletin and putting it on the table and putting it over a door is a piece of how you get that idea into everyone's head all the time, because that's how people learn. Excellent. You, you already got me into the last question, which I'll give you a chance at the end if you want to add anything else, Ruth, but I think that was juicy. Um, what's one thing you want people to take away from this conversation today? Nigel? Um, as individuals commit to the Brit Chazan, as an institution, you should be part of the Chazan Seal of Sustainability. If you're a teenager, get involved in the Jewish youth climate movement. But I, I really just want to say a different word about Tu B'Shvat. Tu B'Shvat tonight. Tu B'Shvat isn't just about fruit and nuts. It's not just for kids. Um, I was at my first Tu B'Shvat Seder in 1986. I've hosted or attended one every year since. And three years ago, I was at an amazing Tu B'Shvat Seder and I was thinking about my dad who was unwell and I'd been back to England and seen the week before. And we got back from the Tu B'Shvat Seder and five minutes later, my mum phoned to say, your father just died. And while I was thinking about him during the Tu B'Shvat Seder, he died and this evening Tu B'Shvat is his third year site. And I think that Tu B'Shvat comes to remind us of something that we should be thinking about every single day of the year, which is that the natural world sustains us and that we're part of this extraordinary web across space and across time. And I, 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 I'm sort of honored, I'm honored to be on this panel with everybody. I'm thrilled that this whole festival is happening, that so many people are doing so many things. And I, I really wanna say in memory of my father, but of all of those who came before us, we genuinely have an obligation to try to leave the world in somewhat better shape than we found it. And I hope in a whole slew of different ways that we do that. Thank you. Beautiful words in memory of your dad. Jenny, would you like to add, what's one thing you'd like somebody to take away from this conversation today? So um, that we need to focus our communal attention on systemic change that we're past the point where we can focus on incremental changes and that it is possible. God says to us when we're wandering in the desert, you know, loba shemaimi, it is not in heaven or beyond your reach. It's in your hand and in your heart and you can do it. We can do this. We have to hold urgency in one hand and hope in the other hand. 
And Dainu circles are one way to, to take meaningful action in community. Um, there are lots of ways to do it, but I think holding urgency and hope, we named Dainu Dainu as a double entendre. Most obviously it's the song of gratitude we sing, right, on the Seder when we're retelling our journey of our story from slavery to freedom. We say it would have been enough if God had taken us out of Egypt, not given us the Torah. It also means we've had enough We've had enough destruction. We've had enough valuing fossil fuel companies over human life. Dainu, enough. And it also means we have enough. We have what we need to confront the climate crisis and move towards solutions. We have the resources and the policies and the technology. We have what we need so that everyone can have enough. So let's get to work. Nothing, nothing less than the future of humanity is at stake. And Eric. So I'll end by saying that we are all so deeply connected to each other. Um, and in ways we may not think about, there may be people in this festival who think they're out there by themselves, uh, caring about this issue, uh, that, that they're alone. They are not. Uh, this not only does the numbers participating in this festival demonstrate uh, the, the passion that exists out there broadly throughout our Jewish community. But if everybody here takes advantage of one or more of the connections you have to whether it's to synagogues, to schools, to communal organizations, and raise your voice within those uh, institutions, it will grow. Uh, and, uh, you know, as, as we, we talked about apartheid in South Africa earlier, as Bobby Kennedy famously said, uh, you know, you, you put that drop of the pebble in the water, it creates a ripple, the ripples join together and form waves that will sweep, uh, that will sweep away the, the inattention uh, that has plagued uh, this issue. So please, everybody take action within your ecosystems and realize that you are part of a broader ecosystem and collectively we'll be able to raise the uh, communal agenda. Fantastic. And Ruth, what would you like people to take away? Oh, from there have been process? lots of great suggestions. <clears throat> I hope you will collect them for the panelists and I mean for the attendees and immortalize them as some of the messages out of this amazing festival. Um, I would add, of course, because that's my theme, is to please think globally. Um, you can sometimes act globally, but think globally. This is a problem for the world. And frankly, folks, any problem we are dealing with in our American Western nation, Jewish bubbles is more exacerbated and more serious elsewhere in the world. And we will get to the better point sooner if we can think about that as well. But mostly what I would say is you've been to the panelists, you've been, I mean, to the attendees, I'm sorry, you've been given lots and lots of messages. You need to figure out what's your own best way of working on these. You need to be sure to do it with other people. And you need to remember to have fun while you do it because it will make the time go faster and the vision be realized sooner. It's very true. And uh, while we are not required to complete the work, uh, we definitely have to be part of it. So thank you all for being part of this and for the work that you do in your own lives all the time, year round to advance this issue and, and many others and for sharing your wisdom and experience here today. And thank you for JFNA for being one of the sponsors of this festival, which really demonstrates a tremendous amount of commitment to this issue. And we look forward to working with the Federation system and many other organizations to, to bring this to life in our community. And thank you to each of our four brilliant and dedicated speakers. You really um, have set the tone for the next five days. Um, and I really appreciate you being part of this kickoff conversation. I want to invite participants to explore all the other sessions that are happening over the next five days, which include things like why and how to divest your organization from fossil fuels, led by AJWS, TRUA, and Carbon Tracker. It's one of many very practical sessions, like how to put solar panels on your synagogue building um, so that you can learn from others who are a few steps ahead of you, find some case studies, get the tools. You do not need to reinvent the wheel yourself. Um, so please take advantage of those opportunities. Um, there's also plenty of learning about policy on a city, state, and national level, um, ways to learn how to engage in the justice and equity issues that are embedded in this climate issue, um, and ways to sustain yourself through Shabbat and Tu B'Shabbat ritual, through song, 
uh, and also our comedy event on Saturday night, because this is a heavy issue and we need to sustain ourselves and add some levity. So I hope you will join us for those events. You can also find on our website under the take action button, opportunities, resources to really bring this to your own community and take action. And also a letter that rabbis Sharon Browse and Rachel Nussbaum have drafted uh, inviting you to sign on to it, making climate change and action uh, a moral priority of the Jewish community. So we encourage you to find those resources on our website, sign up for some additional sessions, learn something, feel moved, bring this back to your own community. Thank you all for being here, for participating, for doing this important work. Happy Tu B'Shvat, and let's get this festival started. Take care. <laughs>